Hey, I'm Bill Inman. I'm here with Grace the Robot. Uh, we're here with Awakening Health. This, the, this is the company hello, that... Everybody. And I'm she says hello. Yes. She'll have a lot to say. Um, so Grace is the world's foremost humanoid healthcare robot. She was designed to provide therapy, work with the elderly, uh, provide a conversational AI in a very human-like form. So she's built on the Sophia the Robot platform. And so very similar from that, Sophia being the most famous humanoid in the world. She has computer vision here. This is where she tracks who's in front of her. She remembers faces. She remembers what she hears. And uh, the eyes aren't the cameras, but there are a couple, ca the main cameras, there are cameras there that help track positioning of people. So if I move this way or I move that way, she'll follow me. Yeah, so that, that mainly comes from there. And, um, you know, this one is obviously a mobile unit. We have these in dozens of healthcare facilities around the world, and we're very proud of it. Okay. We're so lucky that uh, <laughs> Sophia has came here a few years ago, and we do know a bit about her. So I'm just going to move on a bit. Um, two signs or technology that I want you to break down a bit for Grace. Okay. One is more and more robotics is merging with AI, if I can put it crudely that way. Yes. And making it closer, going to almost human or sentient, yeah. or whatever you call it. Right. So can you break down to us um, and the audience here um, two basic science and technology within that initiative right. that is important for us to understand? Right. So. What you're looking at here is artificial intelligence delivered through a humanoid robot. It's a delivery mechanism. So it's chatbots, so are avatars, and APIs into existing systems. So the thing that's different about a humanoid is it looks and feels real. It looks and feels like we can talk to it. And, um, and it's, it's very basic technology, right? There's about 40 motors in the head, ones that are connected to the cheeks, the mouth, and so forth. So what you're looking at is AI-infused robotics. I am not basic. Now, she is not basic, and she wants to make sure that it's very true. Um, so, so simply put, this is artificial intelligence, and it allows people to experience AI in a new manner that they're familiar with. So an elderly person can talk right to a humanoid, looks human, feels human, and it's easier for them to work with that. So does that make sense? Yes, it okay. does. Thank you so much for that. The other part is how, like for example, we have also here being exposed to the Japanese side of the technology where they want it to be like human in the way it breathes or the way the face twitch, you know, sure. all these kind of things. Yeah. So, and that also has to do a lot with the mechanical side of things sure. combined with AI. So how do you see that progressing? You know, uh, humanoid robots don't have a musculoskeletal system. They're, they're a little bit more basic than that. So the Frubber, you know, really cover, Frubber is the name of the skin uh, technology, really covers her face and it doesn't have all the inner workings of human. And, you know, as time progresses, more and more, more motors will be miniaturized so that there's different movements, it looks more human. Of course, as human beings, we're all unique and we're not perfect. So whether there's an eye twitch or something like that, I suppose that at some point to make this more realistic that humanoids will go to that level. Uh, just another thing you asked in the other question is that also this is not a sentient robot. So when artificial intelligence reaches the point where it's as smart as a human, that's called artificial general intelligence. And we're still in the age of artificial narrow intelligence. Do count this for me, tell me about this, write this for me, and that's narrow. So they're not fully human yet, but the illusion that you're talking to an AI that looks like a human kind of puts us into its own spectrum. It, it's, it's different, it's more uh, accessible for many. I want to go there because it was very interesting one particular piece of information that was discussed in your panel just now. Okay. But before I get there, Sarawak is the biggest state in Malaysia, but it's not exactly the first most developed. So it's very hungry to move forward. It's looking at a lot of catalysts for its economy. One of it now is AI and robotics. What sure. advice would you give to these states? Uh, it's a clean slate. Uh, this is everything about artificial intelligence is a blue ocean, meaning it's wide open. It's not as competitive as other areas. So the country and the region can really build upon that and be a market leader, but it has to move fast, right? So I feel like as far as humanoid technology and concern is AI, I can feel at this conference that the, that the region is committed to that. It wants to educate the right people. It wants to move forward. So that being said, 
it's wide open. Uh, you know, what we're seeing hundreds of millions of dollars US funding artificial intelligence companies every week. So it's wide open. There are, in some cases, there are teenagers or young men and, and women that are getting that money. So in the region, I feel like there's a great opportunity just to start, just to go and take action. I think it's more wide open here and it's more optimism. Well, let me ask you this way and maybe beg you to put on your serial entrepreneurial hat. Because in some writings on internet when I Google about you, you're like the extraordinaire that can put <laughs> ideas straight away to business and it works all the time. I, sometimes we struggle with that. We have good ideas, we have good policy, but the business side, the commercialization side, we don't really hit it. And that's going to be costly for robotics and AI. So in our local culture also, it's about respecting the wisdom of the elders. Would you consider looking at Sarawak, looking at Malaysia and pitching your own focus here and help us grow that? I mean, I advise, uh, uh, unfortunately, sometimes from my personal life, I talk to uh, the Far East in the morning and then I talk all the way to Hawaii in the, in, in the, in the lady. So, um, yeah, I'm advising all the time. But let's go back to the first part of the question is that I wasn't born an entrepreneur. I had to make as many mistakes as possible. And being an entrepreneur means you make mistakes until you get it done. Thomas Edison with the light bulb, he had to do 10,000 different light bulbs until one turned on. So you make mistakes and you have to be willing to do that, but you have to take the risk. Now there's a lot of ways to de-risk things. First of all, if you can find a market that you can sell to, it's better to go get a commitment from somebody that has the marketing than to build a product and then take it and say, I hope they buy. It doesn't work like that. You really have to find the market and then build the product for the product market fit. For well, the benefit of the masses, uh, allow me to backtrack maybe a few steps. And you were also a big, big proponent and expert of blockchain technology before. Sure. And uh, in the panel that you were discussing, data is a great focus. Rather than regulate AI and regulate this, we regulate data, for example. So yeah. based on that, how do you see, because this side of the world has tons of data, but many and majority is not in English. It's not even in the local national language. It's in tribal customs and everything else. So what would your advice be? Well, first of all, this side of the world, I'm not even sure. To me, that's not a thing. Because I work with brilliant people all over the world all day, every day. And they're people to me, and they're smart, and, and if they're ethical, and they're passionate about something, what can stop them? So if somebody wants to localize the, you know, the local, even indigenous languages here, then do it, right? You have to, and no, it's not that simple and you need to kind of learn your way around business and so forth. But I think there's so much opportunity in, in creating language models around the indigenous languages and the localized languages that hasn't been touched. If somebody's passionate enough and they learn and they make mistakes, they can help in that way. Maybe they can just contact the engineers who know about it and put two parties together but it's wide open. So much more questions to ask, but I hope you're gonna come back for iTex next year. So a general question, how has uh, WCIT iTex 2023 been for you in Sarawak? Well, you know, this year I've been to maybe going on 16, 17 countries. I've been to CES, I was at LEAP in Saudi Arabia, I was at the United Nations, where cohorts were here. I just did a conference in Las Vegas last week. What I see around here is that I see a, I see a lot of positive people, I love that. Um, because I'm an entrepreneur, so you look for positivity first and you look for opportunity. You don't look for, you have to find the problems so you can solve it. You don't look for problems so you can harp on it day after day after day. And what I see here is a lot of positive people. I see a supportive uh, local government. I see a region that um, lifts up the entire country. So I feel like uh, as long as people here believe in themselves that they can accomplish whatever they want. Because this is not building local AI, you're building something for the world. And you have to look at it like that. I don't think people here should box themselves into what they can do in Malaysia. I think they should look at what they can do globally.